I'm going to ask you to turn to John 20, verse 19, and this is a timeless truth on a quarantined Easter Sunday. You know, the disciples had gone through a lot of trauma on that Passover weekend. They'd witnessed terrible things. Their capital city was in uproar, and now fear grips their hearts. They're in hiding, they're in lockdown, they're in quarantine, and they're wondering what's next. Do you know the disciples' job was to follow Jesus, and Jesus was now gone, and they were probably thinking, well, we're now without a job as well. So John 20, verse 19, will encourage every one of us today. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And so here we are in all our weakness and all our struggle. Our message is come alive. And I want to encourage us as we move through this service that I believe that God can do a resurrection work in our lives. I can see three resurrections in our passage. First of all, Jesus came alive. Let's think about the resurrection of Jesus. Obviously, that's the most important thing. All the gospels tell the story of the resurrection and the New Testament is just surrounded by this central truth. In 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul says that the death of Jesus, his burial, and his resurrection is of first importance. This is the most important truth than, that any of us can hear on this day, especially today. It's first importance. So what a privilege it is on this unusual Easter to proclaim a timeless truth that does not change according to our circumstances. And it's the highest priority fact of all. This preacher this day is very ordinary and this physical crowd in the building is, I, we're sure for a fact, the thinnest in our history. Uh, maybe it's like the first Easter when the disciples even were keeping away probably from the temple. But let me tell you that this truth has never been more sure, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. And after that, more than 500 of the brothers and sisters, all at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. So I want us to think about that simple truth that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Jesus died. You know, death is considered every day right now with coronavirus. We look at the statistics. We see those uh, charts with all the nations. We consider our own state. How desperately sad. We know that this could affect anybody in any nation. And then it becomes more personal when we know someone who has the virus, or we know about a well-known person, and there are many of those, and then someone passes away. Now, the reality, actually, is that people are always passing away and dying. Heart disease, just in America, takes 647,000 people each year. That's one every 37 seconds, and I have a friend who's in danger of that. You know, life is always tissue paper thin. We just don't always think about it until we have to. The average life expectancy in America is 78.8 years. By the way, in the UK, it's uh, actually two extra years that we get, and that's despite having the bad teeth that, of course, we Brits have. Uh, maybe it's their sense of humor, I don't know, or the fish and chips, whatever. But we don't live actually for very long. Psalm 90 is known as Moses' Psalm, and in that uh, wonderful uh, some of those famous words, our days may come to 70 years, or in an older translation, three score and 10. Our days may come to 70 years or 80, if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Do you know something? We were born to live forever, but we've just heard that most of us don't even make it 
to 80. Now, occasionally, we'll find someone in their 90s. I knew a lady called Miss Wilkes in Brighton who was 104. And then there are some that do die young as well. My grandfather's brother was called Reese, and he died when he was not even two years old. We are mortal. How frail we are. And a tiny virus right now shows our vulnerability. Now, in the beginning, before sin came, there had been no death. Can you imagine a world with no death? No one ever died. And then man sinned, and then came death. In fact, the first death was actually a murder. You see, sin and death are relatives. That's the bad news. When sin came into the world, we became mortal. You know, the Latin word mortis means death. We are mortal. We all die. No one escapes from that. And with the first death, there was also judgment, and the Bible tells that every one of us will face God in judgment. All the riches and all the best health care maybe just delays death a little bit, but we are still frail, and that's an important truth we're being reminded of in this day and age. The flowers fall. You know something? We had a tree fall, and it was leaning over our house um, very recently, and all the neighbors came around to look, and we were all commiserated about our misfortune. It's a little picture of what happens when an individual falls, passes away, dies, and then faces God in judgment. The amazing thing about the Easter story is that the immortal God, the immortal God was born mortal and was called to die a sinner's death even though he never sinned, even though we sinned, he died for us. Now, who is this Jesus who died? Do you know something? He's the image of the invisible God, the Bible tells us. The Bible also tells us that in him, all things were created. The Bible also says that he is before all things and in him, all things hold together. I'm on a WhatsApp group um, with a group of friends in, in Wales. They're all rugby people. And occasionally we send each other encouraging messages. And this morning I got one from my friend Garen Jenkins, a tough rugby man. And what was this tough rugby man going to say? It was a, a lady singing a song with a family. He's got the whole world in his hands. These tough guys were really encouraged by the fact that God has the whole world in his hand. That encourages me right now that there is not one molecule of nature that is not subject to Jesus Christ. There's not one thing out of the range of his power. Do you know something in America? We can't even sustain Wi-Fi service. We've been struggling with that in our subdivision loads of times, but God's power range covers every inch of the globe. Again, the Bible says he's the beginning, the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. And the amazing thing about this Jesus, this immortal God who holds all, all things together, is that he came to this earth and became vulnerable. And the Bible says God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And that leads me to Colossians 1.20. Why? Uh, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. I wonder if I can explain John 3.16 a bit like this. For the immortal God so loved the mortal world that he gave his one and only immortal son to become mortal for us, that we might believe and be made alive and ourselves become immortal. Isn't that an amazing truth? So God comes to the earth in Christ to show us the way to live a perfect life, to be a sacrifice. And then the devil thinks, right, we're going to kill the Son of God. We hate the Son of God. He messes everything up. I was in control, I thought. And the devil thinks, what can I do to mess things up? I know I'll kill the Son of God. Let's kill him. Let there be plots. Let there be betrayals. Let there be pieces of silver and beatings. Let's call upon Barabbas. Let there be condemnation and a purple robe. Let him carry the cross. And I will put him in his place. I'll take them to the place of the skull. Nailed, pierced hands on, and nails in those so-called beautiful feet. Thirst. Mockery, here is your mother. Separate the son of God and the mother. Make him cry, my God, my God, the cry of dereliction, a crown of thorns, a spear in his side. It is finished. Satan maybe thought he was in control, 
but there's not one molecule on this earth outside the control of God. This was all God's plan. This was according to the scriptures. This is the perfect way that Jesus came to die for us. What a marvelous truth that Jesus Christ, Christ himself, creator, sustainer God, died for us, the immortal becoming mortal. And then he was buried. Um, There have been some amazing funeral services in history when Mahatma Gandhi uh, died, two million people w- went on the streets. The world had never seen anything quite like that. When Winston Churchill died, my mum often reminds me I was being bounced on her knee when uh, his funeral took place. The funeral of Kennedy, of course, had huge significance in America, the eternal flame in Arlington Cemetery. Most recently, perhaps, Nelson Mandela, the world watched as we said farewell to him. Do you know something? Almost no one was at the funeral of Jesus. There was no memorial. There was nothing to leave to the relatives, so even the relatives didn't bother. Jesus died and was buried in a tomb. It was a borrowed tomb with no tombstone, no monument. His body is hurriedly washed and laid down before the Sabbath begins. Actually, right now, funerals during this pandemic are also being stripped of all but a few mourners. Jesus is buried. And then the pathetic attempts by the Pharisees to seal the tomb. We can stop him rising, right? Well, nothing can prevent the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But in doing so, those plans they tried to make to stop the resurrection proved that there could be only one explanation that Jesus was buried, that he died, that he was buried. And Jesus Christ rose again. That's why we celebrate on Easter Sunday. We've been considering death. We've been considering this real world, how frail and vulnerable we are. But the glorious thing is that God, our creator, came to us in Jesus Christ. The fullness of God in Christ came to us and he died and he was buried and then three days later he rose again. I know that if we were in church we would be praising God. You're allowed to praise in your home if you want to. If someone's listening close by they don't even know what you're doing. You just praise God anyway. Here's the second resurrection. The first resurrection of course is that of Jesus Christ. The second resurrection is that I can come alive. Jesus lives and I can also live. live. This is my resurrection Isn't that a miracle? This is not just a great story we're telling. It's a great true story that actually helps me and helps you in our greatest need. In Ephesians 2, the apostle Paul says, as for you, you were dead. You were dead in your sins, in your transgressions and sins. It's the way that we used to live when we followed the ways of this world. And and Paul also says, we lived at gratifying the cravings of our flesh following its desires and our thoughts. We weren't really free at all. We thought we were free, but we weren't free at all. We were just slave to our own desires and sinful tendencies. But the Bible says, and Paul says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace, which means undeserved mercy. It's by grace you have been saved. This is the miracle of Easter weekend that Jesus also makes us alive if we believe in him and raises us up as well. This is a spiritual fact. Could could the greatest miracle of all be that Reese, who was dead in his sins, dead to God, could the greatest miracle be that this mortal has become immortal. One day I will die or I will face the Lord when he comes, but I've been given immortality, everlasting life. God is God and he saves us, he rescues us. We are not God, but he alone is God. But what a great miracle that he gives the mortal immortality. His life brings me life. And the way I love to express it is this way. I'd love to show you an illustration that we call the bridge. You know, God made us. I've been talking about that this morning. Children, you've heard me say that God made us, and he made us to be friends. He made us to get on well with him. That was the beginning of what it was like for man. But then the first man sinned. The first woman also sinned. Every one of us has followed that same pattern of just doing what we want to do, following our sinful desires. And what has that done? It's brought a separation. So God is over there, And we're over here and there's this great kind of grand canyon between us. And we can't make our way to God. We can't do enough to to atone ourselves for the sin in our lives. But the good news is that Jesus Christ came to die on the cross to bridge the gap between us. 
He was fully God and also fully man at the same time. He's the perfect sacrifice for our sins. And so what do we do? We don't just think, well, that's a nice thought, that's a nice story. We cross over from one side and to the other. We find ourselves in a relationship with him that we who are dead have been made alive with Jesus Christ, and therefore we can live with him forever. When we were separated from God, if we died in that state, we would not be able to go to heaven. We would go to hell. I know that was true for me when I heard this scripture for the first time, and it's actually true for every one of us. We've sinned that much that we can't go to heaven because we would spoil it. But by believing in Jesus Christ, we have everlasting life. And I want to ask, and the message is not yet done, but I want to ask two-thirds of the way through, if you like, with this message, have you asked Christ into your life? Do you know for sure that you belong to him? Do you know that you have eternity with God ahead of you? Well, if, if you're not sure about that, I'd love just to pray what we call a sinner's prayer, where we just make sure that we get right with God. Would you just, would you just bow your head in prayer right now, everybody? Bow your head down and just echo this prayer in your heart. I believe this is a prayer that we can all pray, but maybe someone's going to pray this for the first time over this Easter weekend. Echo this with me now. Lord, I'm sorry for the sin in my life. Lord, my sin has separated me from you. Jesus, please forgive me. Help me to walk through the open door that you have opened for me. Help me to follow you. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose again. Please help me to receive your spirit and to trust you for what is ahead. Friend, you can look at me right now. If you pray that prayer, just put your hand on your heart right now. You know, God can see you do that. Just put your hand on the heart and hold it there for a moment. And there may be even someone in your room that just sees you doing that. Just, just hit your heart a little bit so someone in the room can hear you because you're saying, Jesus is in my heart. He's the treasure of my heart. I'm going to follow him for the rest of my life. If you're on your own right now, I'd love you just to write into us or just go to newhopebc.news. We've got a little tab that just says respond. Newhopebc.news, just go to respond. But here's the third resurrection I want to talk to you about. And this, I think, will encourage every one of us right now. You know, something we can come alive. Jesus came alive. I can be alive, but it's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's about all of us. We can come alive. I want to talk in the rest of our time about the resurrection of the church. You know, uh, what a great uh, song that we sometimes sing about the valley of dry bones. Uh, there's a song out there right now. The story goes back uh, to the time of Ezekiel. And uh, it's a wonderful passage of scripture. You can turn there in your own time. Ezekiel sees a valley full of bones. He, he, he sees this divinely given picture. It's almost like he's there. He sees many, many bones on the floor of the valley. And those bones were very, very dry. And then the Lord asked Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel replies, well, sovereign Lord, you alone know. I mean, God alone knows what's going to happen in the future. And the Lord told Ezekiel, to prophesy to the valley of, by, valley of dry bones for the bones to come alive. You can Google the story later if you don't know it. But imagine for a minute how this beautifully told story describes the bones starting to wake up and then the bones start to connect and they start to get joined together. You know, that's literally where we get the song, the hip bone is connected to the thigh bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Ezekiel then speaks these words of life and there's a rattling. There's a shaking. Can you almost hear right now? The dogs start barking. I made that bit up, by the way. But no, those bones start rattling. They join together. And it started to look like people, a whole bunch of people, almost like an army. But you know something? There was still no breath. The people were there. They were kind of, a, kind of alive, but just there was no breath. There was no spirit within them. And so Ezekiel was called to prophesy a second time come breath from the four winds and breathe into the slain that they may live. And so they start to breathe. And then the word of the Lord says, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your land. And then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. 
Friends, I don't believe it's stretching it at all as we interpret that Old Testament passage in the light of the New Testament. I don't believe it's stretching at all to say God is restoring his church. What's going on right now this Easter time? Oh, there's a bunch of stuff and a lot of noise and everybody has an opinion, of course. But please, Christian, understand this important perspective that God is preparing his bride. Literally, as I was putting these notes together earlier, a bride was getting ready for a wedding, actually in our subdivision, just a few hundred yards away, um, marrying the, the son of some of our dearest friends. Louise even supplied some emergency equipment for the wedding that had to be pulled together relatively hastily after some of the orders we've had from our state. Isn't that amazing? Putting these words together and a bride was getting ready. God is preparing the bride. He's speaking life to us and therefore I believe he wants us with the spirit of prophecy to speak life into one another. And we join in the celebration, friends. This actually is a time of hope. You know, without the Lord, Judas had no hope. With the Lord, when Jesus walks in, the disciples are transformed. They're overjoyed. Their perspective completely changes. They're transformed. Peace, Jesus says. And then he says it a second time. Hey, do you need peace? Yeah, we need peace. We find peace with Jesus Christ. He, he is alive. He resurrects the Christian. I believe he's also resurrecting the church. We are his people. We're his Easter people. We are truly the hope of the world. You know, this passage means a lot to me because my pastor, Ian, uh, around about 34 years ago, uh, moved to Wales, and uh, then he drove me up one of the Welsh valleys, and we talked about Ezekiel 37 and the Valley of Dry Bones, and he asked me the question, he says, Reese, can these bones live? He took me to a church in a place called Ogmore Vale, the church is called Bethania, and uh, he, this building s seated 900 people, it used to be the center of the community. It was the Bible Belt of its time. All the seats would be filled. The place was filled with young people. There was joy and vibrancy. And now there was an inch of dust in this chapel. The windows were broken. And just six old ladies met downstairs. They weren't going to give up. They met downstairs in this tiny room with a single bulb and a, a single bar of electric fire. It was freezing and cold in there. And they were trying to keep things going. And Ian again asked me the question, can these bones live? And at the next year, you know, my church in Tinmouth, we took a choir, about 60 people went up and we did three concerts on a particular day, on a Saturday, I remember it was. And then a few years later from Brighton in 1994, we sent a group of people, a dozen people to the valleys, wondering if these bones would live, where, where God had moved in revival power, could life ever spring again? Well, you know, from that, Many of you will know our story, but by the grace of God, the last 20 or so years, we believe about 130,000 people have heard the gospel. New Hope has done about 110 choir concerts, hundreds of additional events. And uh, let me tell you, the valleys are not teeming with life right now, but you know, there is hope. We've seen God do some amazing things. And I just want to encourage everyone that life is springing up. And through this time, God is breaking up the ground in order for there to be a mighty resurrection. This is the time of the church. It's the time for our church to be alive. And though prevented from being on our mission trips this summertime, we know that we're always on mission. And God is going to do great things. It's the time for the church to rise up. You know, we sometimes sing that song. There's an army rising up. There's an army rising up. Let's repent of our misplaced priorities. There's gonna be a grand reunion when we all come back. I don't know whether it'll be a trickle or whether we'll all suddenly surge in this place. I'm sure we'll all be a little nervous about how we see each other. I think handshaking is gonna be out and the greeting time is gonna be out for a long, long time. But those things don't really matter as long as we see each other, encourage each other and we are the church. You know, the world is looking at us right now. They're waiting to see how we react, whether we serve, whether we sacrifice, or whether we're selfish. I guess the world is looking to see how we deal with adversity and with difficulty. I think the world is looking to see whether we're going to be texting our unchurched friends, whether we're connecting with people, serving in the community. 
I'm praying that uh, God will do mighty things and maybe show love to our healthcare workers and connect with our teachers who are not able to see their students any longer. There's so much to be done right now. One of the things we have to do right now is to stay safe and to stop this virus spreading. But I do believe, friends, that through this, God is resurrecting his church.